Something we've been asked a number of times now during our Q&A series is, why doesn't Intel develop their own kind of 3D vCache? And it's a thought-provoking question, especially given how much of a godsend 3D vCache has been for AMD's Ryzen X 3D processors. Though there are some drawbacks, but before we get into them, I'm excited to talk to you today about the Opera desktop browser because it's genuinely a browser that I love using. It's fast and smooth, but also includes a bunch of super handy built-in features. If I'm doing a ton of research for one of my videos, tab islands are a great way to organize tabs, collapsing groups into space-saving color-coded buttons. Then using workspaces, I can separate out work and non-work related browsing, which helps me a bit with focus and keeps things organized. The sidebar, I find that super useful for quick access to messengers, social media and AI chat features like Opera's own Aria, but perhaps my favorite feature is the built-in ad blocker that doesn't require installing an extension. Sometimes I just want to read about my favorite Star Wars character and the page is filled with huge ads, auto-playing videos that follow you down the page. I just want to see Psy Snoodles. Anyway, with one button click, all that garbage goes away while still giving me the option to allow non-intrusive ads and reward sites that do it right. Download the Opera browser now and improve your internet experience using the links in the description below. Thanks to Opera for sponsoring this portion of the video. Okay, so the drawbacks include decreased core clock frequencies, higher power usage, and higher operating temperatures. In the case of the Ryzen CPUs, the clock speed reduction, it's not that significant given those parts aren't clocked super high to begin with, and the performance uplift achieved by the larger L3 cache more than offsets the decrease in clock speed. Power usage isn't a concern either, and while thermals can be a little bit sketchy with those new Ryzen processors, throttling is very easily avoided. In the case of Intel CPUs, at least their current generation 13th and 14th gen series, the power budget is pretty well maxed out, and of course that's been the subject of much discussion over the past few years, or really many years, and recently it has come to a head. We also know that Intel relies heavily on clock frequency to get the most out of their parts, but I guess many of you are wondering, could more L3 cache solve their woes by reducing clock speeds and therefore power consumption while boosting gaming performance beyond what we're currently seeing? Well, to get a good idea of whether or not more L3 cache would be of benefit, I've rehashed some testing I did back with the 10th gen series with the newer 14th gen parts. Essentially, this is another cores versus cache benchmark. So what we're doing is taking the Core i9 14900K, Core i7 14700K, and Core i5 14600K, disabling the E cores completely because they're not really relevant for this testing, locking the P cores at 5 GHz with the ring bus at 3 GHz, and then testing three configurations, eight cores with the 14900K and 14700K, then six cores with all three processors, and then finally four cores again with all three processors. And this testing method provided us with some pretty great insights into how the 10th gen series compared and what was responsible for most of the performance uplifts we were seeing in games back then. And the answer in that example was L3 cache. But the 10th gen series did pack considerably less L3 cache than 14th gen, just 20 megabytes for the i9, 16 megabytes for the i7, and then just 12 megabytes for the i5s. Fast forward to today though, and the 14600K has more L3 cache than the 10900K did at 24 megabytes, while the 14700K that gets 33 megabytes and then 36 megabytes for the Core i9 14900K. The cores themselves are also clocked higher, though the configuration here has changed quite substantially, but I guess less so if we disable the E cores, which we are going to do for this testing. Finally, I'm also using DDR5 7200 memory and the GeForce RTX 4090. So let's get into it. Starting with the Assassin's Creed Mirage results, this data looks nothing like the 10th gen testing that we did all those years ago. The results are pretty unexpected in my opinion as they appear CPU limited, and they indeed are, yet adding more cores, six to eight, or increasing the L3 cache capacity does nothing to boost performance. Rather, it seems the bottleneck here for the six and eight core configurations is clock frequency. Again, we are limited to five gigahertz for this particular testing, and that suggests that the primary limitation of the 14th gen architecture is frequency and not L3 cache capacity, at least in this example. Dropping down to just four cores does see performance fall away and now cache capacity plays a very small role. 
Still, it's remarkable to see the 14900K drop less than 20% in this test with just half the P-Cores active. Helldivers 2 does see some performance degradation when dropping from 8 to 6 active cores, though we're only talking about a 7% reduction for the average frame rate, with a much smaller decrease to the 1% lows. Dropping to just 4 cores does slash performance quite substantially, particularly to the 1% lows, which were reduced by a little over 40%, leading to a less than ideal experience. Ratchet and Clank, like Assassin's Creed Mirage, sees almost no difference in performance between the 6 and 8 core configurations, again suggesting that core clock frequency is the primary bottleneck here, and it's not until we reduce the active P core count to just 4 that we see some performance degradation. And the drop off here is much the same regardless of the L3 cache capacity. The Spider-Man remastered results are interesting for a few reasons. Firstly, with 8 active cores, the 14900K and 14700K delivered virtually identical results at 5GHz. So again, it seems that the primary bottleneck here is the clock frequency. Then when dropping down to 6 cores, it seems cache becomes more important. Though the margins aren't exactly huge, the 14700K was a mere 3% slower than the 14900K in this example. Then quite oddly when dropping down to just 4 cores active, the results become frequency limited once again, despite performance only dropping by 22% when compared to the 8 core results. Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty sees very little difference between the 8 core configurations. The 14700K is again just 3% slower than the 14900K, and we're only seeing a 7% reduction in performance with 6 cores active, and then a 22% reduction from 8 cores to just 4 cores. But regardless of how many cores are active, it seems at 5GHz cache capacity plays a very small role. Hogwarts Legacy sees no difference in performance with the 8 core configurations, with a very minor variation seen with 6 active cores, though the difference between the 14600K and 14900K here is a mere 5%, and it's even less with just 4 cores active. The performance difference between 8 and 6 cores is also very small, with 4 cores reducing the frame rate by just shy of 20%. Horizon Forbidden West is another game that appears to be primarily frequency limited, as cache capacity makes no difference, regardless of the core configuration. Dropping from 8 to 6 cores only reduced the performance of the 14900K by 5%, and then from 8 to 4 saw a 22% drop which is what we've typically come to expect based on this data. Dragon's Dogma 2 is known to be a very CPU limited game, but like most of the titles tested, we're not seeing that much of a performance improvement when increasing the L3 cache capacity. The 14900K for example was just 4% faster than the 14700K with all 8 P cores active. Then with 6 cores, the 14700K was 9% faster than the 14600K, while the 14900K was 4% faster again. And finally, with just 4 cores active, core count becomes the primary bottleneck. The Baldur's Gate 3 performance was again much the same using either the 14700K or 14900K, and we only saw up to a 5% decrease in performance when dropping down to 6 cores from 8. Then with just 4 cores active, the 14900K was just 14% slower when compared to the 8 core configuration. The Last of Us Part 1 has some really interesting results for us. In this example, we're looking at a 5% performance drop from the 14900K to the 14700K, running with all 8P cores enabled, but with just 6 cores, the margin is reduced to a mere 2%, and then nothing with 4 cores. Rather, it's the core count that makes the most difference in this example. And as an example, the 14900K saw a 10% reduction in average frame rate when going from 8 to 6 cores, while we saw a much more significant 36% drop for the 1% lows. Then from 6 to 4 cores, the average frame rate dropped by a further 24%, with a 32% reduction to those 1% lows. So going from 8 active cores to just 4 saw the 1% lows more than a half in this example. Starfield is another game that scales well with cores, and yet we have another example where the cache capacity has little to no impact on performance. The 14900K saw an 11% performance reduction when going from 8 to 6 cores, and then a further 24% reduction from 6 to 4. Now before wrapping up this testing, I went back and reran a few of the benchmarks, 
with the cores clocked 14% higher at 5.7 GHz, along with a 33% increase to the ring bus at 4 GHz. And I did this because the Oracle told me there would be some extremely well-informed people out there who would call the testing useless because 14th gen processors can clock higher than 5 GHz, making 5 GHz an unrealistic test scenario, despite already learning that the bottleneck is indeed clock frequency and in some instances core count, not cache capacity. So yeah, clocking these parts higher will boost performance, but beyond that, it won't teach us anything we haven't already learnt. And the reason why I didn't do the bulk of the testing at these frequencies is because the 14700K was unstable and would crash, but I persevered enough to get this data. And having tested a few games, well, I found similar performance trends. So again, the limitation here for the 14th gen processors really is clock speed. More cache doesn't appear to help. Well, I've got to say those results were quite surprising and they were much different to what we found three years ago now when testing out Intel's 10th generation core series. Because back then we found that for the most part when locked at the same frequency, there wasn't really that much difference between the Core i5, i7 and i9 processors in most games. And when there was, it could largely be attributed to the L3 cache capacity. But with 14th gen, the cache capacity doesn't appear to matter too much. And in most examples, we found that 24 megabytes was enough. And quite oddly, an increased cache capacity, it often helped the most with fewer cores active. Though of course that wasn't always the case. What did make the most difference was core count. The upgrade from four to six was often very significant. Not that any of these parts come with just four cores active. And then we did see a few examples where going from six to eight cores also did make quite a difference. But what I can tell you, based on all of the data we've just looked at, is that adding some sort of 3D V cache to these 14th gen processors would likely be of detriment to performance, really only serving to reduce gaming performance because it'd probably have to reduce clock speeds. And yeah, that would at least be the case in today's games, yeah, based on the data we've just seen, could change in the future, but regardless of any of that, that's quite surprising information. And I also imagine going up to 10 or even 12 P cores in today's games, that'd only result in a very minor performance gain over eight cores, which is probably why the flagship parts only have eight cores. So really for Intel, the only way forward with their current generation architecture is to boost up those clock speeds, which explains why things have gone the way they have, at least to this point. And that is going to do it for this video. If you enjoyed it, please do give it a thumbs up, subscribe uh, if you like these for science type videos. And we also have Floatplane and Patreon, so check those out if you're interested, but if not, that's perfectly fine. I will also thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.